Hey, my name's Nate, and either you guys are excited to be here or the chocolate is working. And uh, I think it might be a little bit of both. I think it might be a little bit of both. But hey, my name's Nate, one of the pastors. I want to welcome you. If you're online tuning in, I want to welcome. Uh, but that is why we are here. We are here to declare that Jesus is over everything. He's over sickness. He's over death. He's over our past. He's over our sin. He's over our shame. And I know we've got a bunch of different people in this room. Some of you, you couldn't wait to get here to celebrate because Jesus has changed your life. You know, some of you, you're here because your parents said you couldn't open your Easter basket until you went to church. And we know why you're here, all right? Uh, and I know for some of you, you're just here out of obligation. You're like, listen, I don't really want to be here, but if I go to church for an hour, uh, my wife loves me a whole lot more during the week. And so that is why you're here. Uh, or even if you've got questions today about who Jesus is, you're still seeking what is it is. You just need to know that Jesus knows that you're here and he wants you to know today, and this is what his word's going to tell, tell us is this, you're not here by accident. You're not here by accident. Your heavenly father knows you. He loves you and he wants to walk with you. That is what Easter is all about is that you have a savior who's come into the world and he stepped into this world and he's overcome everything so that you and I can have his grace and his life today. You know, what's amazing is if you do more study on uh, the historical research about Jesus, what you'll find is this, Christian and non-Christian historians all agree that Jesus was a real person. They don't dispute that. They go, no, we, we, we see it. We've done the investigation. Jesus of Nazareth was born in Bethlehem under Herod's rule. Everything that the timeline says in the scriptures, it adds up. It's real. Rome was over the leadership. They have documentation. They have historians. And so... Historians don't dispute if Jesus was a real person, but here's where there's a dispute. It's this, can Jesus actually change our life? That's what people dispute. Is he really the savior of the world? And we find in his first disciples is this, they thought he was the one who could come and change their life and save their life. The only thing is this, what they found out when he went to the cross was this, they thought, no, I thought you were the savior of the world. I thought you were going to come and bring all the change that they wanted. What they wanted was a military king. And when he died on the cross, they thought, I thought he was going to come change the world. I thought he was going to bring the change that I wanted and then he didn't. What's amazing is the first disciples, it says this, on Easter Sunday morning, they went to the tomb and it says the women went to give Jesus a proper burial. I don't know if it's because if the men screwed up the burial, right? And they like went to go, the women are like, here's how you do a proper burial, right? You know, and, and that is why they went. But in the text, this is what it says. When the women went to the tomb, they didn't go with the countdown clock like 10, 9, 8, 7, Jesus is going to come out of the tomb. You know how they went to the tomb? Full of tears. For some of you, you've walked in this place today, and all you're doing today is this. You're holding back tears. That's what's going on in your life. You're going, man, I need what's going on in my life to change. And see, this is why Jesus came. He came to step into the hurting. He, kept, he came to step into the broken things. And I love what Jesus does. Is the more you get to know him, what you'll find out, the more you read his word, he didn't hold anything back from his disciples. And he's not holding anything back from you and I. I, I love it in Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. He tells his disciples what's going to happen at Easter. He says, listen, guys, I'm going to go up to Jerusalem. I'm going to die. I'm going to be killed by, at the hands of the Pharisees and the rulers of the law. But he goes, hey, on the third day, I'm going to raise again. And here's the thing. That wasn't the disciples, that wasn't what they wanted, that wasn't the change that they wanted in their life, but here's the deal, it was the change that they needed. And so here today, this is the good news of why we gather, because Jesus offers us the change that we need. Got a quick question for you. What year is it? Some of you are like, is this a trick question? <laughs> right? No, man, it's too early in the morning for trick questions. Just shout out, what, what year is it? Somebody got a year? 2022, you all win. Good job, right? You know, you're like, okay, man, I already feel good about myself. 2022, now finish this. 2022 what? What's the letters? AD. AD. 2022 AD. I grew up thinking AD meant after death. You've heard of BC and AD. See, the reason why there's AD is this. It comes from the phrase anno domini. It means this, the year of our, anybody remember? The year of our Lord. 
Literally, when Jesus showed up on the scene, he changed time forever. Time is marked by Jesus. Time is marked by the cross of Jesus. And this is the good news for you and I today. If Jesus can change time, he can change you. And if Jesus can change time, he can change me. See, we have the God who all of time wraps around. This is the power of the cross. This is why we're here today, is that all of history surrounds itself with Jesus. See, Jesus over everything, the change that he brings, I I can just summarize it in three phrases I want us to talk about today is this. He brings change in our life because Jesus redeems our past. He refocuses our present and he restores our future. Jesus redeems our past. He refocuses our present and he restores our future. Here's what I love about the Apostle Paul in Colossians chapter one, it's this. He summarizes the Easter story in three verses. Some of you are like, is this guy gonna preach very long? Nope, you're gonna get your Easter wish, all right? I'm just gonna cover three verses today, but the power of Paul in these three verses is he covers the totality of Easter. Listen what the Apostle Paul says in Colossians chapter one, he writes to the church in Colossae to remind them about Easter. And listen to what he says, he goes, here's what Easter is. In verse 21 of Colossians chapter one, he says, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. Once you were alienated, separated from God because of our sin, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firmed, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. And this is the gospel. That word just means good news. This is the good news that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Paul says, here's the Easter story. It's this in Jesus, that once you were, but now you are because of Jesus. Once you were alienated, once you had all these sins going on, but when your life changes, now you are a new creation. See, this is what it means to have your past redeemed. It's that every saint has a past and every sinner has a future. That's the good news of Jesus, that every saint has a past. If you were to sit down with me over a cup of coffee, you and I would begin to trade stories about where we've missed it, where we've been alienated from God, where our evil behavior has overcome our life, where the sin has happened, but what we would quickly find is this. Yes, yes, and yes, that's my past, but guess what? Because of Jesus, I have a future. Once I was, but now I am. See, Easter is all about you and I, just simply acknowledging our past. It's where Easter begins. Now, I know this is the deal. Obviously, a lot of us, we don't like talking about our weaknesses. What we like to do is cover them up. That's why I'm dressed like an Easter egg today, right? You know, like we we come into Easter, right? Like I only wear this shirt like once a year on Easter, right? You know, and it's like, that's what we do, right? Put on your Sunday best. Let's come in here because if we look good and smell good and act good, everybody will think we're good. Can I just let you know, there's not one good person in this world except Jesus Christ, right? And so welcome to the jacked up section, right? If you are jacked up, you are in the right place, right? That's why we gather together because once we were, but now in Christ we are we are totally changed and this is what happens when you and I admit what's gone on in our past Jesus begins to free us see the reason why we don't want to avoid our past is this too many times we avoid our past and we act like it didn't happen the only thing is this the more we avoid it the more we're bound by it or this is what will begin to happen to us you just begin to live in the past. You're here today. Yes, yes, Jesus is great. But as soon as you leave this place, you're like, but I know what I've done and I doubt he would ever want to change my life. What you're doing is this, you're living in the past. And what, what happens is this, when you and I live in the past, we quit living in the present. Once you were, but now you are in Christ. And it's scary to admit it because this is what happens when you and I Admit our weaknesses to God, there's a fear of, man, if I admit my weaknesses to God, I wonder if he'll actually love love me back. 
Because maybe in this world you've admitted maybe your, your flaws or weaknesses to somebody and then they turned around and they used them against you. And you're like, all right, no more doing that. Shutting it down. No more telling people my weaknesses. Came across this meme a couple weeks ago. And uh, this is what it says. It says, I'm not saying your cat doesn't care about you. I'm just saying if Lassie was a cat, Timmy would still be in that well. And uh, you know what I'm saying? Like, Hey, and it's not because I'm a dog or a cat person. I don't even own a dog or a cat, all right? But this is kind of the reputation of a cat, right? You love a cat, and what do they do? They hate you back, right? You know, that, that's like what a cat does, right? And this is what happens. Sometimes we know that to be true. And so sometimes here's what happens. We love people or we're honest with people and they don't love us back and it shapes our lives. And we begin to believe that's how God will act towards us. That if I'm vulnerable and honest with God about my past, Man, he's just going to destroy me on the spot. This is what I love about God is this. He's already loved you and he knows your past. That's what Easter's all about, is inviting you to step out of it and into a new life. I love what Tim Keller says in his book, The Meaning of Marriage. He says, to be loved but not known is comforting but superficial. That's when people say stuff like this, love you, man. You're like, you don't even know my name. How you love me, right? Like, hey, hey, thanks for loving me, but it'd be cool if you actually got to know my name. He says, to be loved but not known is comforting, but it's superficial. It's not real. But to be known and not loved is actually our greatest fear. But to be fully known and truly loved is, well, it's a lot like being loved by God. It is what we need more than anything. What I love about the apostle Paul here in Colossians chapter one, he doesn't just tell these people what they need to do. The more you read the apostle Paul, the older he gets, the more honest he gets about his past. The more truthful he's like, yep, this is what what I've done. This is where I've been. This is is who I am because this is who I know Christ to be. Listen, what he tells his protege in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15 through 16, he writes to Timothy, the guy that he's raised up to lead more churches. He says, hey, Timothy, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And then he says this, of whom I am the worst. Paul's like, I'm not even going to, I'm not even going to try to avoid my past. I'm the worst. Well, how could he say that? Because he knows who's the best. See, we can freely admit our sin. When we know who Christ is, he goes on to say this, who I am the worst, but for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. See, oftentimes when we see people's worst, we return the worst. Jesus sees our worst and he gives us Easter, his best. He pours out his best when we are at our worst. That's why next week I want to invite you, we're kicking a brand new series off called Saints and Struggles. Because every single follower of Jesus, this is what I love, every single follower of Jesus, here was the prerequisite. You had to be broken so you could follow him. And what I love about Jesus is this, we're going to look at how Jesus begins to meet people in their failures next week. We're going to look at how Jesus meets Peter after the resurrection and helps him walk through his struggles. Because you and I are going to face struggles the rest of our life, even if we're followers of Jesus. And he's inviting us into this because he's redeemed our past. But here's the thing he wants to do. He wants to refocus our present. See, the Easter isn't just that thing that happened 2,000 years ago. And now it's kind of like, hey, good luck until he returns. Easter is about God's kingdom breaking in here and now in our lives. This is why Paul says this in verse 22. But now, now. Not just in the past and not just in the future when Christ comes back, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death. This is what I love about Jesus. He's not afraid to invest in the mess. If you come over to my house, what you'll find on our coffee table is this little magazine called the Magnolia Magazine. And I'll be honest, I flipped through it a few times, all right? You know, I've been into the whole Chip and Joanna Gaines, you know, Gaines empire down there in Waco, Texas or whatever. And here's why I kind of love it. My wife loves it. And a lot of people that I've met, they, they love it. And here's why. Because at the heart of all of us in this room, we love to see things transform, don't we? 
I remember meeting some people that had that magazine there. I'm like, oh, you're one of those people too, huh? All right, the Magnolia Club, right? And, and I asked them, I said, hey, you got that magazine. You guys thinking about doing some changes in your house? Oh, yeah. Well, what are you going to do? Oh, we're going to move this wall. We're going to paint this thing. We're going to do this. Shiplap, 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 right? You know, and it, like, it's going to be all this stuff, right? And, and all these things are going to happen. I'm like, man, that sounds awesome. When do you start? Uh, oh, it's too messy. <laughs> And I'm like, oh, you have all these dreams. And really what they're saying is this. I have these dreams. I just don't want to create the mess. Oh, I want change. But I don't want to go through the process of change. In my own house, we have a wall that we've wanted to paint for seven years. <laughs> Some of you are like, wow, what is it? You're ordering like a special paint from Italy? No, I just have to buy a special ladder for seven years. I've delayed buying a ladder. <laughs> That's it. We could paint the wall if I would just buy a ladder. Here's what I know. Once I buy that ladder, I'm going to have to buy the drop cloth and there's carpet underneath and it'll probably fall on the carpet. I'll probably fall off the ladder, right? Like I know how this is going to go, right? I know all these things and this and that. I know we know the color. We know this. We know that. Here's the deal. I just don't want to go through the process. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death. I know what I don't want to go through to paint a wall. And Jesus goes, I know what I went through to redeem your life. See, he knows the pain and the suffering that you and I have gone through and he enters into it. He doesn't back up. And then he says this, Paul says he's done that so that he can present you holy in his sight. He wants to transform us from being unholy to holy, which means this. He makes us, he takes us from being an enemy to a friend of God. And then he says, not only do I want to present you holy, I want to present you without blemish, which means you were alienated. And I want to reconcile. I want to bring you back into right relationship. And then he says, and I want to make you free from accusation. You and I carry this guilt and shame around. And he goes, I want to set you free from that. But it only goes through the cross of Christ, his physical body that was broken. I love what 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says. It says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He's patient with you. Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Some of you, you just need to know that today. The Lord's patient with you. You may have no patience for yourself, but the Lord is patient and he loves you. And he longs for everyone to come to repentance. He longs for everybody to turn their life over to the one who can redeem their past, refocus their present and restore their future. About eight months ago, I had a buddy text me and I met him through church here. We played golf together a little bit. And a great guy, successful business guy, beautiful family, talented, like a scratch golfer, right? I'm like, you give me 18 strokes, man, like if I'm playing you, right? And here's the thing, talented guy, all this other stuff. About eight months ago, he texts me. He says, hey, can we meet for lunch at El Catrine? I'm like, I love me some El Catrine. Yeah, I, I, got, I always got time for El Catrine, you know, there in Sellersburg. And so we met about eight months ago at El Catrine. And I'm just thinking, hey, we're just going to talk some life. We're going to talk a little bit or whatever. And he just sits down eight months ago, sits down, tears start welling up in his eyes. And this is all he can get out. Something has to change. Something's got to change. And in my mind, I'm confused. I'm like, dude, you, like, you got it. You got everything going, man. Here's the thing. He has everything going that he can do. But it came to that point. They realized everything that he can get going is actually not enough for what his heart and his soul needs. There to sell Katrine, man, we just started talking about Jesus and what Jesus has done for him. How Jesus doesn't need him to prove his worth. How he's not, his worth isn't his net worth. His worth isn't his performance. It's what Jesus did on the cross. And we began just to talk and over the last eight months, he just began to explore more about who Jesus is and what does it mean to be a follower and what he's done. He had some guys here in the church come around him just to begin to walk with and talk about who Jesus is and what he's done. And then what was so cool is out of the blue, this last Sunday night, he texts me and goes, got time for a baptism? 
Mike, I always got time for a baptism, my man. We always, right? You know, I'm like, I always got time for that. What was so cool is this. This past Wednesday at 430 with his family, some friends around, my buddy got baptized. And it was a beautiful start to this Easter week. Because once, what he found out was this. Once I was, but now I am. Once I was this, I was trying to make myself and I couldn't, I couldn't do enough. But now I am made new in Christ. And I want to invite you, if you're not going to become a follower of Jesus, if you've not been baptized, I want to invite you over the next month. We have a baptism weekend coming up on May 20, 21st. I want to invite you over the next month. Talk with the friend who brought you today. Or maybe you've known you've needed to take this step for a while. Begin to explore, begin to talk with our staff. Like Kyle said, go out to the living room, come over to the cross afterwards, but begin to take that step over the next month. Because what my friend said, as soon as we baptized him and he came out of the water, we were drying off and he goes, man, it's like a weight has been lifted. This burden that I carry, it's lifted. And I said, I know that's what the cross is all about. And what he was talking about was this, but now life. Matter of fact, what that's called in scripture is this. When you and I become followers of Jesus, this is what the scripture says in the New Testament. We are in Christ. See, it is about you and I having Jesus refocus our presence that we are in Christ. Some of you are like, I don't know what that means. Let me tell you what scripture says, that what happens to us when you and I are in Christ. This is what Easter is all about. This is what it says in scripture is this, that when you and I are in Christ, we have the heavenly father, the selfless son of God and the Holy Spirit with us. And we have billions of brothers and sisters. When you and I are in Christ, there is no condemnation because there's new birth, new life. We're a new creation with a new mind and a new heart and a new nature. We have a new covenant with Jesus because the spirit that rose Christ from the dead is alive in us. We've been placed in a new family sealed with a new destiny. In Christ, you have been chosen, saved, accepted, and adopted. In Christ, you have been consecrated, liberated, initiated, supplied, anointed, purified, sanctified, and justified. In Christ, you have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. In Christ, you have wisdom, knowledge, vision, imagination, creativity, focus, and purpose. In Christ, you have the mission of God, the meaning of life, and the mystery of the gospel. In Christ, the veil has been lifted and torn. The distance has been narrowed. The ransom has been paid. The trespasses have been canceled because the chains have been broken. In Christ... In Christ, you have been given power, victory, triumph, strength, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm. In Christ, you've been given a promise that one day you will be vindicated, resurrected, rewarded, crowned, and perfected. In Christ, you have an identity, a story, an eternal value and worth. In Christ, you have the cross-shaped love of Jesus, a realistic assessment of our evil, and even better, a way out from it. In Christ, you have been given an epic mission, an epic purpose, an epic ending filled with the life-giving, hair-raising, breathtaking, Christ-centered love because once you were lost, but now you are what? You are found in Christ. Once we were. Once you were, but now you are reconciled reconciled, put back together through the physical body and death of Jesus. See, he redeems our past. He refocuses our present. And he restores our future. That's what the resurrection is all about. It was God's kingdom now breaking into this earth. The change that the disciples needed was not a military power president. The change they needed came from the inside out over their sin, death, and shame. And they got the change that they needed on that Sunday morning. They got the change they needed. Verse 23 says this. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. 
Do you hear his change? Sinner to servant. Once I was, but now I am reconciled. I've been given new life. Question for you and I today is this. Where do you and I need hope to lead us home? You need to be brought home from your past. Maybe you've been trying to cover your past. You want to avoid your past. You're embarrassed of it. And Jesus just simply says this. Let the cross take care of your past. Maybe you're going, no, Nate, I made peace with my past with Jesus, but life is just frantic. It's scattered. For some of you, this is your first time back in church in two years because you're like, I've got to get back to a rhythm and routine. And today the hope of heaven is just simply this, to allow Jesus to refocus your present reality to allow the power and the magnitude of the cross to recenter your entire life. But for some of you going, no, Nate, I- I'm worried about the future. I'm worried about what I'm gonna go into. Some of you, you got graduation coming up, high school, college, all sorts of things, and you're going, I'm worried. This is what I love what Paul said. He just simply says this, continue in your faith. How do you and I live into the future? Here's how what this, this is what Paul says. Just keep continuing in your faith. Keep living faith, hope, and love out, and you will see the resurrection power of Jesus, because once we were, but now we are reconciled back to God through Jesus. You know, the power is this, everybody in this room and everybody watching online, we all got a story. We all got a once you were story. And what I love what we're gonna do here in a moment is we're gonna hear the story of a lady in our church family named Ginger, who lived the majority of her life not knowing that there was an actual hope. But what happened was this, she began to allow Christ into her past, into her present, and he began to give her a new future. I want you to take a listen to her story and the power of what Christ did, and then we'll come back and we'll take communion together. Listen to Ginger's story right now. Dad left when I was seven, mom raised us four, kids by herself. I know it's a strong word, but I hated him. I hated what he did to mom. I hated that we grew up with nothing. And I just, I really hate it for what he did to my mother. I think that was the most wrenching thing for me, was to see my mom cry and have such a hard life because she was on her own. And so, yeah, I mean, I really hated that man. I didn't want to have anything to do with him, nothing. when I was 32, I got baptized and saved. Um, We began to try and find a home church. And every time we went to a church, they talked about the scripture, honor your father and your mother and you will live long in the land. After the third time, I told my husband, I said, well, I knew God was speaking to me and it was time. So I wrote a letter to my dad and just said, hey, I forgive you for what you've done because of what Christ has done for me. And I didn't realize how deep down that hate was. But to release that and truly turn it over to the Lord and say, hey, it's not my burden to carry anymore. Just like the weight had been lifted. And then a couple days later, I got a call from him. In those 26 years, I didn't know who he was. Come to find out he had become a Christian. He actually started a church and his church was having a a retreat at Ridgecrest. Well, we had a small prayer circle after that, and it broke up, and so we went out. He said, well, you can ask me anything you want. So I asked him if he had any more children, and there was one particular that he told me about that upset me because he was telling me that he had bought her this and had bought her that, and just couldn't believe it because we grew up with mom working all these jobs and not having anything, and yet he provided these things for her. And so at that point, I just got so angry. I just knew that that relationship was over. And so uh, when I got in the room and I was furious, let me tell you. And Sue was my mentor at that time. And so I told her, I said, let's go, we're leaving. And she said, just wait till the morning. If you still feel like that, we'll go. 
So we got up real early in the morning and went out on the rocking chairs. And so she's quoting these scriptures to me. And at that moment, I saw my dad walk across the field out there. I said, well, there goes Terry. And I knew at that moment, because I called him Terry, I didn't call him dad. Something was breaking down. There was some major issues there. And so Sue said to me at that point, she said, are you gonna let the devil win? Or are you gonna let Jesus win? I had thought I had given all that up because I thought I had forgiven him, but I had forgiven him for what I had known, but I didn't know the rest of the story. So at that point, I said, you're right. I said, can't let the devil win. I got a hold of him. We went to his room. He had been crying. Then I just told him that I forgave him and that I was sorry I acted that way. And come to find out his dad had done the same thing, had left when he was young. Even though he'd been a pastor all these years, he still carried the guilt, still carried the unforgiveness. So I believe that had to be broken off of him. If he was gonna go out and minister to people, that had to be broken off of him. And then we just cried and just prayed together and all that was broken. That relationship was dead, but through Christ, I was able to forgive dad, be who God made me to be, not who I thought I needed to be. Once I was in bondage, and now I'm free. And that is the true resurrection story. By leaving my children, by leaving my children was a selfish thing. But the thing is, a relationship has blossomed, which has helped my understanding of the redemptive powers of Jesus Christ, because I never thought it would. Christ really changed my life, but along with that, he brought miracles, which one of them was this. God's still a miracle worker. Here in a moment, we're going to take communion. Hopefully you grabbed one of these on the way in with the bread and the juice. I tell you, that's uh, Ginger's story so powerful. And it's not just her story, it's also the story of her dad. You know, sometimes we, uh, we sin against God and we sin against people, but there's times when people sin against us. And we know God has forgiven us of our past sin, but sometimes we don't know what to do when the sins of others come on us. And see, this is the power of the cross, that the cross can handle it all. Because once we were, but now we are. We've been made right. We've been reconciled with him. And that's why we do this every week. We take the bread and the juice because we remember, oh God, you're not asking me to make myself. You're not asking me to carry this on. This is what the cross is all about. And we're going to invite you to take communion. And if you're not a believer here today, I just wanna invite you during this time, if there's something that you're carrying, maybe it's guilt, shame, maybe it's hurt from somebody else, I wanna invite you during this time as we give thanks back to God for what he's done, just to begin to tell the Lord what you're carrying today. Say, God, this is what I'm carrying. Would you help me? Because God, I, I can't take this anymore. Something's got to change. And so right now, We'll come back and take the bread and the juice together in just a moment, but right now, let us give thanks, and maybe for some of us in this room, we just need to tell the Lord what we're carrying and what we need rescue from today by the power of the cross. So right now, let's just thank our Lord, and then we'll come back and we'll take the bread and the juice together. Father, we can't say thank you enough for what you've done, for how you've seen us in our brokenness and you've not abandoned us, you've not walked away from us, you're not embarrassed of us, but you come down and you meet us right where we're at 
from the sin that we've done and from the sins that others have done to us in Jesus, you give a way to break the power of sin and death forever. And we just stop to say thank you. Jesus, just like time, but our entire lives revolve around you. But our entire lives be marked by you for what you've done on the cross and being raised back to life. We thank you, Lord, and it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Let's take the bread together to remember the body that was broken. And let's take the juice to remember the blood that he poured out to cover our sins. We want to end our time today by singing a new song, a song many of you probably haven't heard. It's called Amazing Grace. And uh, I really think it's going to catch on. I think there's a lot of legs to it. I think it's going to be around for a while. Here's what we love about this song, Amazing Grace. John Newton, the guy who wrote it, was actually a slave who got rescued. But when he got rescued, he went back and he became a slave owner. And his whole life was about being a slave owner. And then what happened was this. He got convicted by God going, that's not the way that the world was created to treat people. And he repented of those sins and he actually became a pastor. He turned his life over to the Lord and then he wrote the lyrics to Amazing Grace. And so I wanna invite you to stand with us today and let's sing these words about the King who has saved us because once we were, but now we are reconciled in him. Let's sing to our King today. Amazing grace, how sweet. knowing we are covered by the blood of Jesus, that our death was buried with him through his resurrection. We are a new creation having new life. Let's share his love, his grace, and his mercy. Happy Easter. We'll see you all next week and everybody.